possible. Okay, can I go ahead and I, I'll go ahead and ask now. Yes, please. Are you guys also assisting in like application mapping and stuff like that? Because I have stuff spread out everywhere. Maybe my developers do not know how my application works, right? Right. Yes. Will you cover that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I think it will get answered. Okay. So, given those problems, what is Contrail security? Now, Contrail security, it relies on, on three primary pillars. The first pillar is that because we want to, um, we want to make the expression of security intent uh, abstracted, we want to decentralize that, that expression of security intent and let application developers specify their intent, Therefore, the uh, policy framework needs to be evolved. Uh, the other thing we want to accomplish is not rely on network coordinates, but be, be able to leverage uh, application attributes. Because the problem stemmed from workload mobility. Now, if workloads move, their network coordinates change. But do the attributes of the application change? They don't. Therefore, if we were to leverage the application attributes, in the expression of security intent, then we won't need to rewrite the policies uh, consequent to workload mobility. So in order for us to be able to do that, the, the, the policy framework needs to evolve. So that's point number one, the evolution of the policy framework. Point number two is with Contrail networking, what we did a good job at was to show the network topology and um, However, uh, in the developer-centric, application-centric world of today, what customers want to be able to do is have the application topology and then be able to visualize the security posture vis-a-vis -vis the application topology. Note emphasis on application topology as opposed to network topology. So that's the goal with the visualization, to be able to show application topology. Even with the first pillar, the goal was to leverage application attributes to describe security intent. With pillar number two, the goal is um, the visualization should be application-centric. And then pillar number three is in order to effectively contain the lateral spread of threats, I want to be able to subject um, east-west traffic within my data center or within my public cloud, um, not just to L4 security, but also to L7 security, IDS, IPS, which is implemented typically in uh, full-blown firewalls. So the vRouter, the Contrail software, the vRouter, or what we also call the FER node, is able to provide the L4 security sitting in the kernel, but we want to be able to, sub to redirect selected traffic, selected by policy, redirect it to full-blown L7 firewalls and subject that traffic to IDS, IPS, uh, et cetera. So I think your center section is going where I was trying to go. Right. So do you require host agents, like on endpoints? Yes. So even with Contrail networking, um, in order to do that fully distributed forwarding, right. we needed what we called vRouter. vRouter, right to sit uh, on the host and sit in the data path. And because it sits in the data path, it can do forwarding, it can do encapsulation, decapsulation, it can enforce security policies. But does it know what processes are running in my endpoint? The uh, router won't know that. Because it does not have visibility inside a virtual machine. Right. But it, do you have that capability? Now, what, what we are going to have on the agenda, I, I don't know whether it's today or tomorrow, is AppFormix. Okay. Now, what AppFormix does, is it has the visibility with inside workloads, and therefore what it can do is security by way of monitoring, by way of monitoring processes and connections. So AppFormix has those capabilities. Okay. But for this here, right, for your application, yeah, for, the, for the visualization, for doing firewalling based or policy, you know, rules based on applications. Yes. How do you understand, you're just looking at packets or how do you understand what applications what, how do you, how you do this? It, it, it's tag based. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll get to that. It's, okay. it's tag based. So let's see what that uh, evolution of the policy framework is, which is exactly going to uh, answer your question. Now, I come back to my favorite three tier application, but let's start with two tiers, web and app. Uh, it's some finance application, and it's currently being built, so it's, it's running in the dev environment. So to secure this application, uh, all I need to do is to allow HTTPS traffic between the components that are implementing the web tier and the components that are implementing the app tier. Notice that this policy is not leveraging a single network coordinate, no IP addresses, no VLANs, no subnets. 
it's only, it's only using tag expressions. So to identify the traffic and to identify the endpoints. Now, notice another thing. Tier equal to web is a tag that could be attached to any kind of workload. That workload could be a virtual machine, it could be a bare metal server, it could be a container, it could be running in the public cloud. You don't know from looking at this, and you don't want to know, right? The workload could be anywhere. So long as it is implementing my web tier, I want this policy to apply. Okay, this is all good until another instance of the application, the application graduates to the production environment, and now you have another instance of the application. This is good, it still secures my application. The policy is fungible because uh, there's a web component in the production environment, there's an app component in the production environment belonging to the finance application. This still secures it, except this will allow the web component in the dev environment to talk to the app component in the, in the production environment. Because this policy does not um, constrain or prohibit this from happening. If I want to prohibit that, we provide that using our patent pending match clause. Now, this match clause makes this policy multidimensional. Because now what it does is, it says allow HTTPS between web and app so long as both of them have the same deployment. So if both web and app are in the dev environment, I'll allow it. If both web and app are in the production environment, I'll permit that traffic. Of course, I'll permit HTTPS traffic. But if web is in dev and app is in production, I'm not going to pr permit that. I'll, I'm going to prohibit that. That's actually extremely powerful. Because if you didn't have the match clause, you'd have to write multiple different rules. I'll take this, I'll take this example a little further. What happens if <coughs> this was in San Francisco and the organization opens another office in, let's say, London? And there's a dev group building uh, the application in the London office. Now you want to secure this application, the policy secures it, except it's now going to permit uh, dev, uh, the, the web in the dev environment in San Francisco to talk to app in the dev environment in London. Obviously, that kind of crosstalk is also not desirable. You want to block that, you want to prohibit that. You just append the match clause with um, match also on the site along with the deployment. Can you also pull tags in, like from vCenter, from Docker, like if I want to use all those tags to? So, um, yeah. so the, que the, op the, the question is, um, how do you scale this uh, creation of tags and attachment of tags? These operations need to scale, and there, should, there, be, there needs to be some element of automation for it to scale well. What we've done as, as a first shot to, to scale this uh, aspect is We've provided an implementation to Kubernetes' network policy. And in doing so, uh, application developers, when they deploy applications in Kubernetes, they write application YAML files. Those are application manifests. And within the manifest, they, they, they leverage several labels and tags. And so we are able to leverage those. The developer workflow remains exactly the same as they, they deploy applications. They don't have to do any extra step. We, we interpret, we infer, the application manifest, and we translate that, uh, we generate tags, we attach tags, all of that happens in a, a seamless automated fashion. Is there a limit on the number of tags that you can? There's no uh, practical limit on the number of tags. Okay. Now, to that end, there's other things that, uh, there's other things we need to do. There are application repositories where applications are already cataloged, so we need to be able to learn the list of applications from there. Um, so those are some of the things that are kind of on the roadmap. Okay. Because the focus was closer to our product, right? Closer to our core offering, what are the enhancements we can do? Okay. There's no doubt we need to solve the scalability of the tagging. Perfect. Five minutes. Um, so this example goes further, but it's further illustrating the, the policy framework. So this is pillar number one, evolution of the policy framework. Don't rely on just on network coordinates. You can still use network coordinates, but um, allow the use of tag expressions that are basically leveraging application attributes. And the second thing is our patent pending match clause. Um, so in terms of tags, to begin with, given that this is the first offering of this tag-based infrastructure, of this tag-based security, we start with a set of prescriptive tags, prescriptive set of tags. 
uh, that identify what the application is, what environment is being deployed in, which location is being deployed in, what component tier, what component of the application it is. We have a fifth kind of a tag, which is a label, which can be completely freeform. And with Kubernetes, we have complete flexibility. Any ar arbitrary key value pair can be used as tags. But in any non-Kubernetes environment, we, we limit customers to these five prescriptive set of tags. <coughs> But it, it, it reinforces the point that our architecture doesn't confine users because in Kubernetes, we have given complete flexibility to use any arbitrary tags when you're writing the application manifest. So the label or anything custom, is that importable or do I have to manually? So like if I want to pull data from ServiceNow or Infoblox or? It's, it's, it's possible, okay. but today uh, some scripting, some amount of stitching needs to be done. Um, what we are working towards is eliminating even that bit of scripting or stitching that needs to be done. And that is another point which you think is important in the next section, which is when you think about the multi-cloud, some of these enforcement may happen on physical devices. Yep. Now, if you take physical devices and tax, it's a bit of a an abnormal concept where you don't have a normal way of defining tax associated to virtual interfaces and interfaces. So that part is still kind of to be figured out how it works in a multi-vendor environment. And just a quick question, if you have an additional, for example, IDS, like you've shown before, where would that fit into here? So what would need to happen, it's actually covered in the last slide, uh, okay. last couple slides of this presentation. I'll, I'll get to that, I'll answer that. Um, so in addition to tags, we have some other grouping constructs, <coughs> um, but these are fairly self-explanatory, so I'll get to some more interesting bits. Um, so this is just a, 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 a reiteration of that. Uh, the additional point we are making here is tags can be attached at different objects in the hierarchy. Now Contrail has the notion of a, of a project. Within a project, there are multiple virtual networks. Within virtual, virtual networks, there are workloads that may be VMs, containers, or bare metal servers. And then each of these workloads have one or more interfaces. So tags can be attached at any level in the hierarchy. And then tags attached at higher levels of the hierarchy get inherited by the lower levels of the hierarchy. So ultimately an interface will have a collection of tags and that collection of tags will define, um, will therefore map to corresponding set of policies and those policies will define the, the security posture for uh, that workload, right? So the collection of tags um, uh, that get inherited by the in interface, either directly attached to the interface or inherited by parent objects is what defines the security posture. So you, um, when you start doing the enforcement yes. on the, the security policies, yes. are you just leveraging like the, the endpoint IP tables or, or no. this is something built into the vRouter? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. And that's actually a major point of differentiation that we are not leveraging IP tables. Okay. And IP tables, there, there, there's various uh, reasons, technical reasons for not leveraging IP tables, but to... We, we, we do it in the forwarding workflow. So these policies, they are, um, they make their way into the, the flow table in the forwarding table, right. and therefore in the process of forwarding packets, we are making the policy decisions as well. So therefore it's, it's more seamless than uh, an IP table solution. So you're actually doing real time. It is real time. I mean, I'm, instead of saying this is the rule you're getting, you're actually making assumptions and, and doing the calculation based on the flows and changing it in flight. Right, so, so behind the scenes, what happens is these tag expressions, they translate to BGP communities. Okay. Now I'm going under the hood, uh, if, which is not entirely necessary, but, but that's really the power, the magic of the solution, that we are using BGP communities, and therefore it works extremely well with the, the BGP control plane, and uh, that allows us to uh, do this enforcement as part of the forwarding. Okay, cool. Now this is the visualization, this is the pillar number two. Now, what's happening here is uh, it, 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 looks a it's, it looks a bit crowded, but essentially the outer circle represents, so this is application topology. The outer circle represents the combination of the application and the environment the application is deployed in. And the inner circle represents the tiers of each individual application. And then these flows correspond to these, these uh, arrows, these, um, uh, bars, they correspond to the flows between application components. So either there is 
intra application or inter application flows and they are color coded the blue colored flows are flows that are explicitly protected by policies and the red colored flows are those flows that exist because there's no explicit policy protecting that flow and so those are the flows you want to pay immediate attention to that i don't have explicit policies for these flows let me look at what these flows are. Who are the senders? Who are the receivers? What kind of traffic is being sent? Do I expect this kind of traffic? If I expect this kind of traffic, I better have an explicit policy that permits this kind of traffic. And if I don't expect to see this kind of a traffic, why don't I explicitly write a policy that blocks this kind of traffic? Because I don't expect to see this kind of traffic. So that's the value of this application topology and showing the security posture vis-a-vis -vis the application topology. So to be, to be clear, is this a visualization of the policy or is this a real-time generated visualization of the traffic based on the policy? It, it's, it's a visualization of the traffic vis-a-vis -vis my application topology. Okay. And then your question is, where are the policies? Right. So if you, if you click on any of these flows, It'll show a, a pop-up display, which will show all the matching policies, whether implicit or explicit. It'll show all the matching policies, and then you can get more details. So there's another screenshot here. Okay. So I, 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 I clicked on a flow. First, it'll only show me the policies. If I double-click, it shows a drill-down of that flow, of what traffic comprises that, that, that large uh, bar. So it's showing me the policies that match that flow, right. and then what traffic and who are the clients and servers that comprise that flow. How is, is that generated in real time? Does that yes. automatically update? Yes, 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 uh, indeed, most certainly it does. And, and, and my next question, I've got lots of questions. Oh. Please. Uh, <laughs> can you ac access this programmatically via an API? Everything in Contrail is exposed via northbound APIs, both config oh, operations right. and operational uh, semantics. Everything is exposed via uh, RESTful APIs. So in theory, I could take this information and I could build, I could tie it into an existing visualization platform based yes. on something else because all the data is available via yes. API. We, we have examples of customers who have tied this together with things like Grafana, for example. Okay. And, and there are other examples, but just- So you can do pre-tied integration just based on that simple but fact. The UI right is just re a rendering of the API, it's nothing else. Now, yes. when you UI get into, doesn't do anything else. And Excellent. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I would assume that when you get into the application part tomorrow, it's also going to tie into this view as well. So you're going to be able to drill in, you look at a flow, and then drill into the application and say, oh, that's that process that was running there, and be able to detect either. So uh, given that it's part of, whatever. given that it's part of app part? formix, right. I don't want to com comment on the specifics okay. of that, okay. because it's a separate product managed by a separate team. Okay. So it's best answered by, working together though, right? we do work together, but, but when certain features are coming, et cetera. I, I don't want to comment on those aspects. Just, just, uh, just like networking very quickly. work together. Just, <laughs> just, just before we continue, I just want to know the base, the in out by on bytes. How did you gather this information? So what Easy. is the base on that detail? So, yeah. so what the vRouter does is it gathers uh, different kinds of information. It's sitting in the data path, so it can gather flow information, it can gather uh, system state information, all kinds of statistics, and then it sends all these statistics to the controller. Now within the controller, there's a component called the con collector. The collector collects all this kind of information, it collates it, and puts all of that in a uh, highly available Cassandra database. And off of that Cassandra database, where you have consolidated view of the entire system, that's where uh, this is being generated from. So, is so, so actually, you have the full flow data. You could dig into who are the clients that connected to that part, yeah. all this information you have, and you can visualize as well, yeah? Yes. Is okay. it, is it be internally, is it packaged as just like a JFlow or something? It is, it is similar to JFlow, but this does much more than JFlow, which is why we leverage, we, 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 um, we wrote a proprietary protocol of our own, we call it Sandesh. It does more than JFlow. Now, that being said, the collector, as an ingestion mechanism, as an ingestion scheme, it supports S-Flow, NetFlow, IPFix, Google Protocol Buffers, SNMP. It supports all these ingestion schemes. Okay. What that does is it allows 
the collector to also ingest um, uh, telemetry or other information from network devices like switches and routers and other sources of S flow, J flow. So you get a full picture. Yeah. Exactly. Are you doing sample based or is it? That was, that was my we next can do question. Both. Okay. You can do both. <laughs> it depends on the device. Yeah, you can, it's yeah. like, it's like we set. share a brain. Yes, it is. Not, it is it's configurable. Not capturing payload and all that. It's just. It's not capturing like payload. It's not. Can it do that on demand? I'm sorry. Can it capture payload on demand? I mean, if you take S flow, it's 120 bytes uh, excerpt, okay. right? So you are capturing part of the payload. You can take IP fix. You have got aggregate data. It depends on the device ultimately. Well, no, I mean, right? and so, so let's say for example that I want to see more detail on a specific flow that's ongoing. I, I want to grab more extensive pieces of that payload. I'll answer that. Yeah, okay. What, what we can do is we have the notion of service chaining. What is service chaining? The V router, based on policy, where it, the policy determines what kind of traffic, based on that policy, the V router can redirect traffic to an entity. Now, that entity could be an analyzer, mm -hmm. like a Wireshark or anything where you want to inspect the payload. So we have that capability. That's very cool. And my next question is uh, I'm going to make a statement, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. This supports, it doesn't care if it's v4 or v6. Um, let me, yeah. It's, it's v4 and v6. Okay. Supports v4 and v6. Thank you. Because it is based on tags, right. and tags are BGP <laughs> communities, the payload can be. That's yeah. why I framed it as a statement, not a question. <laughs> yes, thank yeah. you. Also, that's the answer I wanted to very, hear. Very, very, very quickly, there, there's this last component that I want to touch upon that, 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 that relates to uh, how do you forward traffic to L7 firewalls. We want to be able to subject traffic to full L7 <laughs> security. So it, it relies on this ability of the V router to, based on policy, redirect traffic to to network functions. We don't care what the network function is, <coughs> but in the context of control security, that network function happens to be a, an L7 firewall. Now, um, there was some question as to how that, how that firewall becomes aware of these uh, tags, and therefore, there needs to be integration with the firewall management platform. In the case of the SRX, it's the security director. In the case of, uh, let's say, uh, Apollo Alto, it's the panorama. There needs to be integration. We are working with uh, the firewall vendors, uh, and we are working on this integration. So tags that are configured here, they will be recognized in, by the firewall. So, so this is uh, ongoing. And now what you see the larger picture is the points of enforcement. Where can you enforce seamless, uh, same set of security primitives? On host-based L7 firewalls, they could be appliances, or these firewalls could run on every host. Um, the V-router can run on a bare metal server, on a compute that's running virtualized or containerized workloads. We can also put the V-router on network interface cards. Um, and then they can run in a public cloud instance, right? So that's what you get uh, with control security. I want to very quickly make um, um, this point that we are providing an implementation for Kubernetes's network policy. Kubernetes network policy, it, it comes only, they, they only have the spec, they don't, it, Kubernetes doesn't come with an implementation. It relies on the network plugin to provide an implementation. We have provided an implementation that leverages this tag-based framework that we've been uh, talking about. That is pretty much all. This is the takeaway. Um, same set of network policy framework and analytics and monitoring across all these different um, environments. I'd like to That's ask one more thing, if I could. Please. Do you guys, and, and, and I'll hold off if you're going to get into it, but do you also have the ability to play back conversations that happened as well as be able to model? before implementing the policy itself? Yes, so um, that's, uh, that's coming in our next okay. iteration of uh, um, next release. Okay. We are working on uh, such features. Okay. Because what we have is, in, in our analytics database, we have all historical flows. Right. So when you create a new policy, we have the ability to leverage historical flows and um, see how this new policy that I'm planning to introduce, how, yeah. So we have uh, that feature being okay. currently worked on. Thank you. I've got a question real quick here on the, uh, from Kevin Myers on Twitter. Um, asking, asking, does Open Contrail replace existing hypervisor platforms or complement them specifically for NFB of route switch? So hypervisor platforms like KVM, ESX, 
we complement them, right? The hypervisor solves the compute virtualization problem. We solve network virtualization, and we also, on, on, uh, on the same set of software, we are also now providing software-defined security. But, I mean, and analytics. Ultimately, a virtual routing instance, though. Is, is that a good way to think of it? The, 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 the vRouter is a little bit of a misnomer, a little bit of a misnomer, because the right parallel or the right analogy is actually the forwarding engine. On a line card, you have a forwarding engine. The vRouter is like a forwarding engine. It's not a full-blown router. But is that, you're just using is that because your centralized flow. policy is somewhere else, though? Is that, is that why you say that? It's because... Um, is your control the, plane the, somewhere yeah. else? The control plane is somewhere else, yes. Okay. But, but that is going to process all your packets in, in that virtual instance. You're going to do all the packet processing there. The, the vRouter does yes. it. Right. Just exactly like a packet forwarding engine does right. on a line card. So for clarity, the vRouter is running kind of at hypervisor app level like a vSwitch would? Yes. Or is it it's as opposed to being another VM that's simply in the same physical location kind of thing? No. Um, in environments where we are allowed to run in the kernel, like KVM, Linux environment, we run as a kernel module. Now, for performance reasons, we also have a user space offering, which allows us to do DPDK. So packets arrive on the NIC, they are sent to the user space, they bypass the kernel stack. Uh, and further, for performance reasons, we also uh, run on the network interface card. Then there is uh, no need to go to the software stack in the kernel or the user space. In environments where we are not allowed to run on the in the kernel, like VMware ESX, we have no recourse but to run inside a virtual machine. Okay, and that was there was a couple of questions around that on Twitter, so I think I'd, thank you for the clarification. Sure, yeah. thank right. you. So with that